Welcome to the Chimney and Fireplace Success Network, a weekly broadcast sponsored by CVC Success Group, hosted each week by industry speaker, coach, author, and educator, Jerry Eisenhower. Our presentations are produced to assist business owners and managers in turning their business dreams into their business realities. And now, here is your host, Jerry Eisenhower. And I want to welcome you to another episode of the Chimney and Fireplace Success Network. This podcast is sponsored by CBC Success Group. Remember, our goal, our mission is to provide the tools to make your business dreams into your business realities. Well, this is podcast number 80 means I've done 80 of these episodes now, and I've had some really great guests on. And today is no different because today my guest is a guy that myself and Cheryl depend on as a mentor, as a coach, and he's also a very good friend. And I know he's someone that I can reach out to at any time. Now, I'm kind of jealous because he's got this magic voice for radio that probably every public speaker in the world would love to have. He's wrote some tremendous books, and we're going to talk about some of those today. And he's also spoken. He was actually a speaker at the National Chimney Sweep Guild Convention several years back. And he deals with people in blue collar industries because I'm in a group coach set, group coaching group with this guest and along with some of his friends. So he's very familiar with the challenges that many of you are gonna have. So my guest today is none other than Scott McCain. And Scott McCain, he travels internationally, he speaks, he advises, he is a busy guy. Every time I turn around, he's on a plane to Australia or something else. And I know that Scott brings significant value to the table, so settle in. Get you some notes ready to write because I think Scott's going to give you some gold nuggets to move you forward. So, Scott, you out there ready to rock and roll today, brother? <laughs> you bet, Jerry. I, I'm glad you didn't. You, you mentioned the voice. I'm glad you didn't say anything like, you know, you, you got a face made for radio, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> nonetheless, it's great to be with you, as always, my friend. That's it. And for a guy that grew up working in a grocery store, I breathe in Carothersville, Indiana, now lives in Las Vegas, Nevada has faced some tremendous personal challenges in life and has set himself. And we're going to talk about two subject matters today, Scott, because when I think of Scott McCain, there's two words come to mind. And one is distinction. And another is the word iconic. And this has been books and things that you have talked about. So I want to talk about those two words today and what they mean for people. Does that work for you? It works great. You bet, Jerry. And so you guys know, Scott has no idea what questions I'm going to ask him going in. We're going into this cold. So I want you to imagine Scott and I are having a cup of coffee right now. He's in Las Vegas. I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. So we're talking via the World Wide Web on, you know, on a virtual meeting here. So Scott, tell me what it means to have a business of distinction. What does that mean? Well, distinction means that you stand out from your competition. If if I'm looking for you know a chimney sweep, if I'm looking for home maintenance, whatever it might be, why would I choose you instead of the competition? What what makes you stand out? How do I find ways and and I I always say ways other than being the cheapest uh, that that would attract me to choose you instead of the other alternatives that are out there in the marketplace. You know, that's one of the things I think we often forget in, in, in any business, but particularly entrepreneurs and small business, is that customers don't choose us. They choose us instead of all the other alternatives that are out there. And because of, you know, you mentioned the World Wide Web, because the Internet, Jerry, as you well know, customers now have more access to, to learn those, those alternatives. Uh, I'll show my age, but, you know, it used to be you'd go to the Yellow Pages and take a look and see who had the best ad. and and that kind of thing. Well, now, good grief, they can go on Yelp. They can go on, you know, any number of different places to to read reviews and and everything else. So it's it's getting harder and harder to be chosen. So distinction is, what do you do to stand out so you're the one that gets picked? You know, Scott, one of the things that I've learned from you, and it's helped me tremendously, and I also pass this along 
to my own clients and in the classes is I sat at one of our UBS intensive meetings and UBS is the group that Cheryl and I are in and Scott is one of the people that runs this along with Randy Pennington and Larry Wingett. But you talk often about the ability to tell your story and that's part of what being iconic is. So could you touch on what somebody's got to have when they tell their story? Look, in any story, I mean, there, there's two things that interest us about any story, and that's characters and conflict. And if we don't care about the characters, and if we aren't interested in the conflict that they find themselves, then we're not going to be interested in the story. But too many times, those of us in business, you know, we, we, we want to tell about all the good that we've done, and we want to tell about, oh, here's, here's our great business, and we start talking about all the things that we do, and there's no conflict and we haven't made the characters very interesting. So part of what I coach business leaders to do and, and, and entrepreneurs and frontline salespeople it, it is to think about what makes a good story from their perspective when they're watching a TV show or watching a movie. And, and it is characters that they're interested in. So let's start with that. Your, your customers and your prospects are always gonna be more interested in stories about other customers than they are about your business. And the reason is because they can identify with other customers. That's who they are. So telling customer stories as opposed to stories about your business is, is really, really critical. The second thing is the conflict. And, and given the things that, that the folks listening to this podcast have seen in terms of you know, home fires and home safety and all of the things that you bring to, to the marketplace because of, of what you do, uh, man, there's there's some incredible conflicts and some incredible challenges that you're qualified to talk about that can really make for compelling narrative and compelling stories about why they ought to pick you. You know, and that takes me back to a coaching call I had this morning at 10 a.m. And in this coaching call, I have a client that I've worked with for a couple of years. He's actually changed his business direction. And I told him, I said, you know, you found the perfect niche for you which is hard to find, but it's a niche he's good at. He likes to do it. And I said, now the thing is, is building your authority. And he told me something. He said, Jerry, I got a hard time talking about myself because mm -hmm. it sounds like boasting. If you had that conversation with him, what would you advise him to say, Scott? Don't, don't talk about yourself. Um, talk about the customer. Now, let me tell you about Mary, who was in a situation where, and, and and the conflict, and then when we were able to come in and do this, Mary's conflict was resolved. So in other words, you're not talking about yourself, you're talking about the customer, and then you become the catalyst that helps the customer solve their problems. I, I totally get what they're saying. It's, it, you know, you, it, it's hard sometimes, you know, because one of the things I think we realize innately, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about, is we we just know that customers don't like people who brag uh, constantly about themselves and their business, but yet the perspective is different from customer to customer, right? I mean, Jerry, you and I are both pretty outgoing, so it the 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 level of brag is a lot higher than it might be for you know a a, a homeowner looking for a, a chimney sweep. Uh, what you and I would consider marketing, they they might consider boasting. So what we have to do is to soften that a bit and understand our audience, just like a movie uh, producer or director has to understand what their target audience is, and, and soften it up a bit, not in terms of softening up the power of the message, but how we construct the message so it can have more impact. Got you covered. So telling a story of how a customer's pain was eradicated by your service and how you were the superstar. Is this the type of story you're talking about, Scott? Yeah, exactly. Uh, years and years ago, I, I had the privilege of uh, being a, a movie reviewer that was syndicated to 100 TV stations across the country. And that provided me the, the, the great privilege of interviewing, you know, movie stars and directors and, and everything. And, and uh, I was talking to Quentin Tarantino about Pulp Fiction. I don't know if you've seen that movie or not, but uh, Samuel L. Jackson and John Travolta started, and, and they're hitmen, they're hired killers. So if they start the movie talking about hired killers, all of a sudden we'd be against them. But it, it really begins with them riding in a car 
and talking about the Whopper at Burger King and how in in France, you know, in France, the Big Mac is La Big Mac. Uh, so, you know, we, we laugh with them, we connect with them, we see their characters. So then we see the conflict they're in as hitmen, and and it we're not turned off by them as much. Now, if if they came in and said, "Here's hitmen," we we go, "Well, we hate these guys," but but by connecting with them first, we kind of like them. We want to see what happens to them next. We can make any character interesting. It's just how we do it. And and so, what it, what does that mean to your business? It means that you take a customer and you put them in a, you tell the story of the situation that we're in. And the reason that you're telling that story is because your other customers and your other prospects are going to identify because they're probably in the same situation. You know, yeah. it's like Quentin Tarantino told me, yeah, we're, uh, they're not hit, man, but we've all had a Big Mac. <laughs> you know? And so we find this common ground. And, 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 and that's what we're doing by telling our customer stories instead of our story. It, two of us are chimney sweeps, right? So it's harder to get customers to identify with that. But, but we all have a chimney. And in telling the story about the customer is the way that you connect with them in a, in a way that has more meaning, more resonance, more, it's more compelling when you do it in that approach. Yeah. So I'm looking at your book right now, Iconic, Scott, and uh -huh. chapter three is titled Play Offense. Tell me a little bit about Play Offense. When I was doing the research for the, for the book Iconic, I was trying to find out what did iconic businesses do that most others didn't. And the other thing I was committed to was because, you know, my, my dad had a small town grocery store and, and I, 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 you know, grew up in small business. I was trying to get away from what, what a lot of the folks do that write business books. And when they talk about Apple and Starbucks and Southwest airlines and Amazon, I, I wanted to find something you know, a little, a little bit smaller, a little bit different. So I looked at everything from restaurants to, 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 you know, chimney sweeps, home safety groups all over the board. And, and what I found without exception was that those that really stood out were those that played the game in their, in their own way. Now, it, I don't mean they were ignorant about the competition. They, they know who their competition are. You know, they, they, they know what their competition is doing, but they're not obsessed with the competition. They, they, they focus on, what can we do to serve our customers uniquely? Let's create our own game plan rather than focus on, well, let's be $5 cheaper than the competition. Well, if, you know, if they're open till nine o'clock, we'll be open to nine 30, you know, the, those kinds of things, because every moment that you spend worrying about your competition is wasting a moment that you could be innovating to make them irrelevant. I love it. This is so. What you're saying is to be iconic, you got to be the better mousetrap. Don't worry about being a cheaper mousetrap, but be the better mousetrap and be willing to express why you're better. Am I hearing that correctly? Absolutely, Jerry. And you know, one of the other crazy things is, you know, as, as a sports nut myself, I, I've always heard, you know, we we talk about it all the time, football defense wins championships. Well, what I found out is if you look at the numbers. It just isn't true. Uh, 38 of the Super Bowl winners have had a top 10 offense. More, more than had a better defense. I mean, it, most of the NFL playoff games were won by the teams who had a higher ranked offense, not a higher ranked defense. So if we really look at the data, it's, it's offense that wins championships. So yeah. we've got to get out of this mindset that we're going to be defensive about our business and protective about our business. What we have to be is on the offense. We we have to take the ball and carry it across the goal line to, to use the sports analogy. That's that's what's going to win championships for us, not just not just defending our current turf. Gotcha. So this brings me to chapter five, which is an amazing <laughs> one. It says number three, stop selling. Now, yeah. that's kind of reverse. So tell me what you mean by stop selling. Look, at, at the end of the day, you know, I grew up in grocery stores and if nobody goes through the checkout lane, the, the store is going to close. And if you don't get customers, your business is going to close. But what's happened, I discovered in the research and this, that, you know, it, it was really hard for me to write a chapter and title it Stop Selling. But, but the reason that you stop selling is because what you start doing is creating experiences that your customers want to refer and repeat. The iconic businesses, regardless of their size, were the ones that focused on how do we create this great experience in, in what we do and how we follow up 
in, in all of that because we can market that experience as something that makes us unique and, and, and part of our offensive strategy. We, we can get customers to refer us. They'll repeat their business. I mean, let, let's face it, Jerry, growth in any business is the combination of acquisition and retention. I think a lot of times we think, oh, we're going to grow our business. We're going to get out there and sell more. And I've seen companies, and I'll, I'll, I know you have too, small businesses, they get so focused on selling more, they don't take care of the customers they've got. And what good does it get? It doesn't get. It doesn't help our business to get more people in our tent if if people are going out the back of the tent as quick as we can bring them in. So yes. what we're trying to do is, is uh, you know, on the farm I grew up on, Dad always used to say, "Close the gate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make sure nothing gets out." And, and that's what we're trying to do here is to close the gate. We're going to figure out a way to create this ultimate customer experience so that the, the people that are doing business with us want to come back again and they're willing to refer us, and we have something we can market in terms of the experience that transcends an individual transaction. Here's the other thing. People are tired of being sold. Man, I go on LinkedIn, and I, there, were, there were literally there were 11 things today. Can I pick your brain? Do you want to set up a call to talk about how I can serve you? Do you want to, you know, we have all these folks that are asking us to buy before they bring any value to us and give us a reason to engage. And, and, you know, and that's, that's what's got to change. Right. And you know, that's dead on top because we actually teach a sales process in our company that's called no selling sales. In other words, we encourage them to stop the sale and present the value. And Absolutely. everything is about the value, not the hard sale, but ensuring that you are giving them the value. And another interesting thing you just said, Scott, was existing customers. Because so often in blue collar world, we see people chasing new customers and they're not marketing to their existing customer base. Yeah, that's such so, a great point, Jerry, because yeah, let's let's face it, uh, your existing customer base, I'll bet you there's probably something else you could do for most of them that you currently aren't doing. Yep. Don't, don't, don't you think? I mean, that, that's what I've seen in small business is that, oh, they say, oh, they're our customer. Well, is there a way that you could grow that customer? Is there something else, another service, another something that you could provide for them that you currently aren't doing? Yeah. That's, that's an incredible spot for growth, but yet most of us miss it. You know, some years ago, there was a really phenomenal distributor and he's actually still in the business. He sold the distribution company some years ago, but he computed in the chimney sweep industry, the lifetime value of a mm. customer. Now, Scott, this was probably 25 years ago, but he ran the numbers and came up that the lifetime value of a customer was in excess of $30,000 in this business, $30,000. Wow. Yeah, and yeah. it kind of opened a lot of people's eyes up of doing repeat service and making sure they're aware of the services that you offer and how you can help them. So now I got another question for you. And this is another one. Like I said, when you read the chapters, <laughs> this is a good what? one. Number four, go well, we'll next. Back to that and see what you just <laughs> said for just a second. Today, if that's not too much trouble, Jerry, because I got to tell you, I do uh, a lot of work in the automotive industry, and and that's part of uh, to to your point. I I, I want to make sure that everybody catches it because it's it's so important. You know, in the automotive industry, if if you see a customer come in and they buy a twenty five thousand dollar car, uh, you you kind of think they've got twenty five thousand on their forehead. And and part of what I try to teach is. You know, if they buy a $25,000 car every four years for 20 years, you, you better be putting a different number on their forehead. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, how, how you look, if you look at them as a $20,000 transaction, or if you look at them as a $150,000 lifetime value, it changes the way that you approach them. And, and what you said is so important that we need to be thinking more lifetime value and less about this individual particular sale. Okay, in that light, I'm gonna let you steal a little bit of Randy Pennington's thunder because Who? he loves to talk God. about <laughs> is it Sewell, the, the car dealership in Dallas that he's always talking about? Yeah. 
and how their service department and how they keep their business. Yeah, I mean, Randy does such an extraordinary job of talking about it, uh, in, 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 in part because he's, he's a customer there. But, you know, everything is geared to, well, here's, here's part of what I talk about, and it dovetails with Randy's story. If, if we think about it, most businesses, regardless of size, are, are structured vertically. Here's our sales team. Here's our service team. Here's our accounting team, finance. You know, here's our management team. But customers don't experience this you know, vertically. They, they experience this horizontally. They look at us as, as a business they're doing business with. And so part of what Randy talks about, about Sewell and, and what I talk about with other companies is customers don't want any gaps. They, they, they want to make certain that the, the experience is seamless. And so the service department helps the sales department. They're, they're all one big sales department in a sense because if you get great service, where are you going to get your next car? It, it all works together. And, and that is what is so critical that most businesses need to be focusing on. Got you covered. So what does, what does those words go negative mean, Scott? Well, I think many times uh, two things happen, Jerry. Number one is if, if somebody brings us a problem many times, uh, and I've been guilty of this in my own business, sometimes I, I I don't, you know, I, I want to be out there making things happen. I want to make things work. And if somebody brings me a problem, depending on how they bring it, I might think that that's a negative employee. We got to be able to separate those two things. Yes, we do have negative employees, but, but bringing us a problem is one of the best things they can do because you can't fix a problem you haven't identified. So we want to encourage our employees to be positive in their approach but not be afraid to bring us negative information because you can't fix a problem that, of, 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 which, of which you're not aware. But the second oh. thing is this. So many times, we have, if we have a dissatisfied customer, we don't go negative enough to figure out what created their dissatisfaction. In, in other words, customers got a problem. We fix the problem. We want, we want our customers to be happy, and that's a worthy goal. But something happened in the process that fell down that that created that dissatisfied customer to begin with. It, it might be that we didn't train our employee as thoroughly as we should have. It might be that we weren't clear with the customer about what we could. Something happened along the way that created that. And, and too many times we put a Band-Aid on it and, and try to make the customer feel better, but we don't go negative enough to see, hey, where did we mess up? What's wrong with the process? Because if, if we fix the process, then we've solved what created that customer, uh, the problem. And we've also ensured that we're not going to do it again and create more dissatisfied customers. We have to be willing to dig deeper into what we're doing wrong so that we can do things right for the future. Right. And, you know, you know, the thought that comes to my head as you said that I'm thinking of the restaurant that gave me crappy service. Mm -hmm. The restaurant that, you know, the hostess really wasn't real nice, made us stand there. We really didn't feel welcome. And so often the restaurant says, hey, let me give you a free dessert to make up exactly. for this. Yeah. I don't want you to give me a free dessert. I want you to fix your problem. In fact, a lot of times I'll even tell people, listen, I'm not telling you what I'm getting ready to tell you to get a free dessert or a discount. You've got a problem over there. I'm trying to make you aware. This is killing your business. And so it's the same thing. You can't sugarcoat it with that free dessert. you got to dig down and figure it out. In fact, we have a system that we use with our clients that we came up with called the post-mortem inspection. Mm. Now, when I say post-mortem, what are you thinking right now, Scott? Yeah, after death. <laughs> Correct. Well, in a way, it is because we even tell them you got to dig. Now, I'm trying to put in your minds death. You with me? Yep. So, you know, I want you to think, and we want to do a post-mortem inspection and trace this back to the beginning because there's a problem way back there that we got to fix. It's not that we got an upset customer to satisfy. We got a problem in our process. So we call that investigation a post-mortem, and you got to dig to get those answers, and usually comes up that 
your process is broken, you don't have a process, or someone didn't follow the process. That's usually when you find the mistakes. Would you agree? No, totally. Totally okay. agree. You, you're absolutely on it. You, you made me think of the Tammy, my wife and I were having dinner uh, here in Las Vegas at a restaurant that, that's kind of, you know, uh, well known, or at least their their Hollywood version is well known, and they opened a, a, a branch here. And and uh, oh my gosh, it was terrible. It took forever to get served, and the food was cold, and and it just so the manager came up as managers do, as you said, and uh, uh, rather than offer a dessert, he offered us a coupon, you know, the discount on our next meal. And yeah. I said, why would I ever want to repeat this experience? And, yeah. and you could tell he, he had not, they had not told him what to say to that. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I have no desire to come back. I, I have no desire to experience this again because it's not just bad food. It's bad people. And you know, he, and he, did, he didn't have a response to that. So. Right. And what this reminds me of last summer, we were in Las Vegas for our meeting. Yeah. And I remember walking over to you and saying, Scott, what's the best steakhouse in Las Vegas? Yep. What's the best one? And you and Larry and, and my Ben Randy said, go to this steakhouse. I had never heard of it before. And it had been Gold there for yeah. how long has it been there? Oh, good grief. Since the early 50s, probably late 40s, early 50s. Yeah, because when you walk in there, you're feeling like Saint Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin should be sitting in this restaurant. And you I see mean, the really, pictures where they did. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what you're doing. You're going back into time, and you told me, said, make sure you get a Caesar salad. And the guy comes out to the table, and he mixes the Caesar salad up table side. And it was just, you know, it was just a phenomenal experience. And you look at that, and here is a restaurant that I asked someone I trusted. You gave me your testimonial which you're not going to give unless you truly believe in it. And we went down and it was a phenomenal experience. And it was I gotta tell you, I, I've got to give credit. My, my wonderful bride, Tammy, I, I was given a speech on Valentine's day and got home early evening on Valentine's day a couple years back. And she said, I'm going to take care of planning our dinner. So she picks me up. And the one thing you didn't say, it, it's it's on Sahara, and it is in a bad, bad strip mall. <laughs> right? oh, so yeah. we, we pull in this place, and there's a liquor store next to it with bars in the window. There's a pawn shop. And I, th I said, okay, funny, you got me. Where are we really going? She said, no, this is where we're going. I said, baby, I'm afraid to park the car. <laughs> you know what I mean, it. I, I just thought, oh my gosh, I thought it was, it was horrible, right? When, when you, it, there had, the, I, she's, I, I don't want to be too critical because she's made, you know, my, my darling wife has made some kind of bad mistake for our Valentine's day dinner. And we open the door and we walk in and sitting there waiting to, uh, for val their Valentine's day dinner. Uh, the longtime mayor of Las Vegas is a guy named Oscar Goodman. And then he, served out the number of terms he could serve. Now his wife is the mayor. They own a steakhouse in downtown Vegas, but for Valentine's day, they were eating at the golden steer. And I thought there must be something good about this place. So anyway, we, we had that great experience. So I, I, I tell Larry about it. So Larry brings his two you know adult sons every year to uh, the, the national finals rodeo. And, you know, Larry's one son has done extraordinarily well in, in, in the field of, uh, clothing design fashion made a lot of money and uh, so larry takes them in and they pull in the parking lot and larry's son turns to him and says dad is everything okay i mean you know if, <laughs> if you need some help i can take us to a better dinner <laughs> and he said and, and, you know they take him in they had the same experience and and so that's that i that, and jerry you make such an important point if we pull back for a second and that is if you think of the people it started with tammy going there she read the reviews on Yelp. So we went there. So then Larry took his boys there. You went there. I know between the recommendations that Tammy has given her friends and I've given mine and Larry through me has given his, that restaurant has made thousands of dollars. But I also know that the restaurant in Vegas that just tried to give us a coupon for our next trip and didn't, I know I've cost them thousands of dollars there was a conference that was meeting at their hotel 
And they said, Hey, and we were going to take everybody to, you know, this restaurant for lunch. And I said, man, you need to find another place. I, I, they cost them thousands of dollars. So, you know, there's, there's the point, the, the power of fixing problems that generates better experiences that generates referrals. It, 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 we, it's, it, I think it's the most overlooked aspect of a business's balance sheet. That's it, because you, what you or my, myself would have never pulled in that restaurant to see it from the outside. There was oh, nothing. Absolutely. Oh, gosh, in. yes. Right. Right. There's nothing to draw us in. I, th- I doubt they have any social media presence whatsoever. It's kind of like earlier this week. We eat a lot of barbecue around here. Went to a bar- we went out to a barbecue restaurant, and they don't take credit cards. And I walked to the door. And as I was paying, I said, just interesting. Why don't you take credit cards? And I already knew the answer. And the woman said, we hadn't taken credit cards for 50 years. Yeah. Do you see, do you think it's given us a problem and the restaurant's running over people? I don't think it is because the food is good and it has a reputation. So let's talk reputation a minute because when I go to chapter eight and I'm going to paint a little picture for you go into this, if somebody's listening, that doesn't have the best reviews. Maybe they don't have the best reputation. Maybe they've made mistakes in their past. And now they've decided we're going to build a business to be iconic of distinction. Well, your chapter eight says regaining iconic status. What do you tell that business owner if you were in a conversation with them? Well, I think they first of all have to face reality. Is is there any demand for what they're doing in the marketplace? Right. I mean, um, there there are some businesses that go out of business, and we don't miss you at all. And then there are others that go out of business, and you know, if they were willing to get their act together, we'd sure give them another chance. Uh, we, we can all think of 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 national examples that way. I mean. Jerry, if Kmart closed their doors tomorrow, I don't think anybody would be standing on the street corner crying that they just could not believe that they could no longer shop at Kmart. Nope. Uh, I mean, it, it, they they just don't create a customer experience in the manner that we would miss you. Uh, when the company that made Twinkies went bankrupt, people went crazy. <laughs> we want our Twinkies. Right? So... I, the, the owner of the business, particularly in a small business, really has to have a, 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 a you know, a, as we would call them back home, a come to Jesus meeting. I mean, it, it, is it, you know, is there enough goodwill left in the marketplace that we could we could reboot this? If that is the case, then it, it really gets serious about fixing that problem. Uh, what, what created the problem that took you down or that created the, the bad reputation? And, and how do you confront that? I, I think I think what we we see even you know nationally in the in the media is that if somebody owns up and says, "Man, I I messed up. I I dropped the ball. I've made a mistake," and people know what mistakes are because we've all made them. But here's what I'm going to do to fix it, and then you do. People are willing to give you another chance. What they don't want is for you to say. Well, because of the economy, we, you know, had a rough time or because of a supplier or because of uh, the customer doesn't care about that. Y- your job is to serve them. And, and so, fi- you know, owning up to what your problem is and then saying, and here's how we're going to fix it. And then you got to do it. And if you do those things, I think customers are willing to give you another shot. Yeah, I consider that a magic moment in life. I actually put that in some of the books I write and articles. It's about this magic moment. And, you know, you've had your magic moments. You know, there was a time you said you had to branch yourself into speaking. And that's where you came up with the word distinction. And that's what we all have to do is find what is that niche? What is it will take us forward to where I call our dreams of where you want to go in this life? Well, Scott, let me finish this off. My listeners, you're familiar with them. You have them in your group. You know what they're like. You see their challenges. What will be your parting recommendation to these people to do what I say, get your business dreams and turn them into your business realities? What will be your advice to that person? Well, that's, that's such a great question, Jerry. I, let, me, let me preface it by saying this. You know, 
my dad bought a grocery store because he was, he was a terrific butcher and it, it was a way that he could take those skills and, and be an entrepreneur. Uh, I have done a lot of work in, in the car repair business. So somebody buy, you know, somebody starts a body shop. They do it because they're great with cars. I, I think when we look at many entrepreneurs, what attracts them to the business is that they understand the business, that they understand the product. But what we often don't understand, my, my dad had to learn the hard way about customers and the folks with body shops have to learn the hard way about how you deal with insurance companies and how do you deal with customers who just had a car wreck and chimney sweeps have to deal with customers. Very few of us start a small business because we love, we, we want to love customers. So we'll figure out the product. No, it's the other way around. So the one thing that I would encourage every entrepreneur to do is to get as much training and learning and education as possible on how do I become more focused on the customer experience? How do I deliver that experience at a higher level? How do I educate and train my people? You know, people don't say, hey, I want to go to work with a chimney sweep so I can serve customers. It's because they know the job or they want the job, not because of the customer. So the more that you can train and educate your people, the more that you can train and educate yourself on, on the aspect of the customer experience, the better off your business is going to be for the future. There you go. Well, listen, folks, this has been Scott McCain, who's taken time out of an extremely heavy, hectic schedule to spend some time with you today. Scott, I want to really appreciate it, but let me ask you this. Your books, I will definitely recommend. Iconic well, and anything you can learn from Scott, I'm telling you. We said a while ago, he does a lot of research, and that's the thing about it, you know, in writing books. And if you ever get an opportunity to listen to him in a, on a stage, go there. And Scott, I mean, put in a put, tell people about your UBS intensive or in a meeting in Las Vegas. I want you to invite people into that if you'd like. Oh, gosh, I appreciate that, Jerry. Yeah, uh, and, and you've heard Jerry mention it. Uh, Larry Wingett uh, that you often see on Fox News and Randy Pennington, who's one of the best in the country in terms of uh, strategy and, and how organizations get results. And and I were, were longtime friends. We all grew up in, in uh, smaller communities with parents who were involved in small business. And it's kind of our way to, to – to be engaged with entrepreneurs and small business. We have a program called the ultimate business summit, and that's all you need to do. Just go to ultimate summit.com and you'll learn more about the program that we're going to have coming up uh, uh, this year. And it's, it's, it's just a great program. It, I, I'm, I'm so proud to be a, a part of it because it, it talks about the problem. One of the things that makes the, you know, you, we talked about distinction. So uh, a, a question is, okay, so what makes this distinctive? And, and one of the things I think that really makes the, the UBS program distinctive is it's driven by the participants, not by the people up front. Uh, Jerry, as you know, one of the first things we do is what's, what's the most important question that you can have answered? And, and we don't stop until everybody gets their question answered. It's, it's not that we're going to come in and pontificate for, for a couple of days. It's that we're going to answer your questions. So, I'd encourage everybody, just take a look at ultimatebusinesssummit.com. We'd love to see you in Vegas in August. Uh, so it, it, it's it's been a value to, to many, many organizations, and we'd love it if it was of value to you. Yeah, we've actually brought the chimney mop in there before, hadn't we? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's one of the things, and I know this sounds like what, you know, what the guest on your show is supposed to say and all that kind of stuff. But, man, I'll tell you what, my, my experience when I spoke at the conference in Louisville many years ago, my experience with you, Jerry, and and the, the the people that you bring into the program for us, man, you talk about great folks. I mean, everybody in your business that I've met is a salt of the earth, you know, down to earth, blue collar guy like 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 my dad was in in his little store, and and like I hope to be, and and like the people I love hanging out with are. So it, it's one it's one too that that I know that you would that the your listeners they'd feel very comfortable being there and, and, and would learn a lot and get challenged a bit, but at the same time feel very comfortable because if, if there's one thing this conference is not, it's not stuffy. <laughs> well, 
this is a compliment to the three of you. When I say I consider you all dear friends, I do. I also consider that, you know, I've been, I go to a, I've been to a lot of high level coaches in my time. You know that I don't, you know, I've I've spent time in John Maxwell training. I'm not going to have dinner with John Maxwell. I know that, but yet we're friends. I know Do you guys understand. And it's my challenges. Whenever I have challenges in business, you understand them. In fact, so people know Scott and I have a call scheduled in a couple hours later today. And that's the kind of people, because a lot of people don't know I'm a coach, but I have to have my coaches and mentors that I go to. And, the, and I can pick out like Scott has certain skills. Randy has certain skills and Larry has different skills. So I'm able to go to people that have expertise. I recently had a conversation with Randy and Randy helped me out a lot of focusing in on what I have to do because we're just like you. We have to have that help too. So Scott, I want to really appreciate you that your time today, the value you bring to people, brother, it's unreal. So thanks for being here. I hope I can have you back in the future sometime. I really appreciate it, Jerry. It's always great talking to you and hanging with you. And, and this is really a, a special delight. I really appreciate it. Okay. So we want to thank you for joining us for this episode of the Chimney and Fireplace Success Network. Remember, this is sponsored by CBC Success Group. Take a look at our online educational platform. It's a virtual platform available 24-7, 365 days a year. And if we can help you at CBC Success Group, just reach out to us. Let's have a phone call. Isn't it time that we talked? And with that, we'll talk to you later. Appreciate you joining us. It's an honor, it's a privilege, and it's a pleasure. Talk to you next time. Thanks for joining us here each week at the Chimney and Fireplace Success Network, sponsored by CVC Success Group, providing you the coaching and educational outreach services you need to move to your dream destination in business and in life.